So we're gonna well, now we're gonna go on to another topic. This one really it bugs a lot of people. This one kind of bugs me a little bit. Um, I'm in Israel and just about ready to go home. I had a good time. We studied karate over there, and I had my bags packed. I'm drinking coffee. There's this guy named Amir Peter. You will enjoy the good coffee that we have here in Israel. He, th he thinks of himself as American. He says, I, they really think I'm American. I actually have a name. It's an uh, American name. It's Mark Ashley. <laughs> a policeman pulled me over, and uh, I told him I was American. He, he believed me and let me go. <laughs> so I'm sitting at his house, <clears throat> and I noticed I got a cell phone message, because you get those cell phones that are pretty cheap. You could call America. Three messages. Peter, it's Russell. Call me immediately. Hmm, that's weird. It's four in the morning in New Jersey. Hmm, I'm starting to get a little like freaked out. Next, Peter, it's Russell again. Uh, call me as soon as you get this message. I bought a mirror, a plate, you know. An orange, one of those nice Israeli art. When Israeli art is bad, it's really bad. <laughs> but that when it's good, it's, it's great. Got him a nice plate. Peter, my wife enjoys this plate so much. We, she wants to, to serve uh, with it, but I want to be an art piece. All right, Amir, just give me a break. Shalom, the LL Airlines. LL Airlines, call your parents. My dad's been dead for 20 years. Call your parents in Minnesota immediately. What the? Peter, the, you know how it kind of gets into dream mode? Peter, the plate, in the plate, the plate, the plate, the plate, plate. I'm holding the cell phone, but my wife can see what Amir can't see. Some shit is going down. I'm getting all sweaty. I say, Amir, I, I, and I dial in my brother-in-law, Russell's number, 1201-967-1369, and all you can do is like, dude, your gateway to tragedy. I say to Amir, enough with the plate. There is some shit going on down. I must sit and call this number. My wife is freaking out, like, already. Shh. Hi, my sister answered the phone. Peter, Susie died in a car accident. My sister, this summer. Hmm. Okay, I say. I'll call you back later. You get official, you try to take care of business. So, without any further ado, because the question is on my mind. Why do bad things happen to good people? I don't like that exactly. Do you suppose that God cries? That's my question. I, the second half of that story is you had called me from the airport. Um, And thank God I've been blessed that I haven't had firsthand and uh, a, uh, a personal tragedy of this caliber. I say that because all the knowledge you have and all the wisdom and all that you've been trained to know and to speak and to communicate really is absolutely meaningless uh, at a time like that. It's, um, there's a story about this rabbi, a great scholar who's in, in Russia, <coughs> and he, he was well respected, he was loved, a man of many uh, colors and many blessings, but tragedy struck. His, without getting into details, his entire family <coughs> Everything that uh, was dear to him was all wiped away. It was a mishap, it was a uh, mishap on, uh, on a, I think, on a boat that capsized. 
And uh, when the news came to town, nobody wanted to, s- who's going to volunteer to tell this to him? Besides that, he was so loved and respected in general, who he, no one wants to carry such news. It's a true story. Finally, so to speak, the lucky quote on, on, on quote one was his, his uh, favorite student. They said, listen, you're his student. Go, you have to share it with him. And he's running around, you know, procrastinating and buying time. What is he supposed to say? What's he going to say? <coughs> um, so he goes into his, the base medrash, which is the yeshiva where they're studying. And he sees the Rosh Yeshiva, his teacher, is standing by the table. And he goes over, Rabbi, Rebbe, I'm struggling with a difficult passage in the Talmud. And the passage in the Talmud is, in the Mesech de Brachas, the first tractate called Brachat, it says that just as you have to bless God for the gifts in your life, you also have to bless God for, God forbid, the klalot, the curses, the tragedies in your life. He says to the rabbi, tell me, how could you equate the two? I understand that we have to acknowledge it, we have to live through it, but how could you equate, how could the Talmud equate a blessing and a tragedy? Dancing with, at your daughter's wedding with, God forbid, uh, absolute tragedy I don't even want to mention an example. So the rabbi, who is brilliant, goes into a long dissertation explaining that no pain, no gain. Through the descent, you reach a higher ascent. And he goes into the whole story that, that through breaking things, through tragedies, at the moment it's painful, but it opens up new opportunities, new growth, whatever. The student, obviously, not, not buying it. He says to him, but still. So the rabbi goes into the next slew of, of arguments. That we don't understand God's ways. And this is a challenge to open up our horizons. And I'm not going to go through. I'm sure he went through every answer that you've ever heard in every book and every treatise, whatever. And the student will not let go. This is his way of obviously approaching the subject. And he says to the rabbi, but please tell me. It's still, how could you equate the two? They're all nice explanations. So the rabbi says, listen, it's true, it's hard to understand, but the fact is, that's what the Talmud says. If you're a godly person, you understand that there's a deeper picture, there's a bigger picture, and the two are just two sides of God's experience. One is, are you telling me that you have to dance when something tragic happens just as if it was the wedding of your child? He says, I know it sounds impossible, but ultimately your attitude has to be the same. So now the student says to the rabbi, Rabbi, you could start dancing. (laughs) And he told him what happened. Well, what do you think happened? The rabbi didn't dance. He fainted. And when they finally revived him, the rabbi says to the student, suddenly I don't understand this Talmud at all. That's what he said. This is, in my mind, captures the essence of Moses was a man who was wiser than anyone. Even wiser than King Solomon, by the way. The one who spoke to God face to face. Heard about all the mysteries of life and death. Yet when it came to tragedy, particularly the tragedy of death, the Talmud, the Mishnah Medrash says, and the Talmud says, that he was able to understand all the mysteries of purity and impurity except when he saw the tragedy of death. Too much mess, the impurity or the tragedy or the, the spiritual dissonance of death, it says Moshe became dark. This is the expression. His face became ashen. He began trembling. And he turned to God and said, how can we ever purify from this? How can we ever heal from death? So, when one chassid came to a rebbe, with a great tragedy in his life, the Rebbe said to him, I don't have answers for you, but I can cry with you. To me, and I've been, all the years I've traveled and spoken and discussed, this topic really deserves silence. However, 
you're silent, people won't know what you mean. So you have to say something in words that is the equivalent of silence. Not silence out of weakness, or silence because we have nothing to say, but silence out of awe. There's an expression about the Holocaust survivors that was used by Sadikim, and the truth of any survivor of true tragedy, senseless tragedy, that the survivor is called the Od Mutzl Me'esh, a burning ember. You see a building burned down. Besides the tragedy of the building that burned down, is you know, you look at the embers that are still smoking and still charred and black, but they remained. We don't have answers to this question, period. And that itself has to be stated unequivocally. And that is in respect of the mystery of life and death. Somebody gets up and tries to wax eloquent and discuss and explain. Not only is it arrogant, it's, it's stupidity, it's vulgar, it's an abuse of the, of the, the, the loss. It's abuse of God's mysterious ways. Now I know this is the big question everyone says, that if I could understand how bad things can happen to good people, how a good God could allow such senseless pain, I would believe in God. I say, that une I say unequivocally that's baloney. If people have problems with believing in God, it's not because there's pain in this world. It's because they don't like responsibility. But that's another discussion. It's a great excuse. I remember, I'll never forget, at one t talk I gave, I was, I was a, it was a panel discussion. It was about the topic of pain and suffering. And on the panel was a Holocaust survivor. And some arrogant little uh, philosopher, major philosophy in some university in the United States, gets up and starts going on and on about you know, huge religious Jews, you know, completely oblivious of pain and suffering. What kind of God after you heard what happened to six million? Anyway, the Holocaust survivor slowly stood up as we sit here, and he unrolled his, his sleeve, and he showed him his number, and he said, how old are you? 25 years old. He said, what tragedy did you experience that you can tell me about your loss of faith exactly? What uh, chutzpah do you have to stand here? Are you gonna tell me that I lost my entire family and I still believe in God, you're telling me that what, that I'm a, I'm a fool? Now, I don't know what this guy was thinking, but you know, of course his pride couldn't accept it. And he started like smirking to his friends, you know. But it was pretty obvious what happened. We have no right to enter into the sacred place when a person suffers. And I speak now personally to you, Peter, and to anyone that has had any loss of that nature. It's sacred, it's between you and God. If it causes you to challenge God and challenge your faith in God, that's just as sacred as if it causes you to have deeper faith. We don't enter there. It's the Holy of Holies. It's the mysteries. It's the mystery of life and death. But one of the most powerful things that when Job, the classic sufferer Job, you know, in Crown Heights we have a rabbi. I don't want to mention the name, but he's like a living Job. You should see his life story. Children that died, his wife. I mean, it's, it's, it's a. So I mean, I've I seen it with my own eyes. So Job says to God after everything is said and done, he says to him, "Why?" And what God answers him, I think. God says to Job. I'm paraphrasing. He says, "Were you there when you asked me this question? Why? In other words, why such loss? Why such pain? Why such senseless agony?" Were you there, God says to Job, when I created it all, when I created heaven and earth? That you asked me this question. Now, when I read it the first time, I thought, you know, what is, that? What is he saying exactly? I mean, he's pulling rank, basically saying, like, you can't understand it because I'm the creator and you're just a creature. But then I realized, no, God was giving him the deepest and most real answer possible. God was saying, you ask me why there's death do you ask me why there's birth? You ask me why there's pain. Do you ask me why there's joy? You ask me why there's suffering. But do you ask me why there's life? We don't ask why we're born. We don't ask why we're happy. 
We don't ask why we're alive. Because that's a given. We take it for granted. And maybe that's good. When things don't work, we suddenly ask. That doesn't mean the question is illegitimate. But God is saying to him, the mystery of death is directly connected to the mystery of birth. And the mystery of suffering is directly connected to life. Because if there was no life, there'd be no suffering. And if there was no birth, there'd be no death. So I think in trying to sum up the Jewish approach, it's a paradox. On one hand, it's silence, sacred, no words. We don't understand the Talmud. Yet at the same time, that is not resignation or surrender. It's a way of embracing the, maybe the dark side of the moon, the dark side of existence, which is intricately bound to the side of light in ways we should never know and, we don't, and hopefully we will never know. But when you lose a sister like that, and when I heard about it, besides you know, his friends, and I, I'm just coming back from Israel this morning, by the way. So I saw firsthand what's going on in a place like that. And, uh, we, you know, all of us, I mean, you hear the news, things happen. I think what Jews learned over the thousands of years of our history is that we may never know why, but one thing for sure, we never fold and we never give up. We may not know why, but we know what we have to do. And that's the question, what do you do? I remember a man who lost his wife at a young age with 10, 11 children, no question. He was asked, how did he survive? And he said, I had two options. Either I sink or I dig deeper. And I wasn't ready to sink. I see many people who sink. You see people come out of tragedies and the tragedy is manifold and double and triple in their lives. A second Holocaust. Ultimately, we, the only answer is that you have to reach a deeper place. And this is not something that happens overnight, it has to grow, you never, may never know why, but you know one thing that you can become stronger and that you can teach that strength to others as well. And yes, God does cry. So, so someone will say, with well, God's crying, hey, why doesn't he stop us crying and let him stop crying? Well, it's part of the mystery of existence. But to say that God is not there my brother wrote a beautiful article, I mean, you can call it beautiful, but it's about this topic a few weeks ago. That God is there with us. There's no question about it. Is that a consolation? Yes, it is. Because the loneliness of pain is worse than the pain itself. That's what I say to you. Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak. Same question, same thing. Hmm. Same question, same thing. Different sweater, same question. <laughs> I would add something to the question if I may. Go ahead. Yeah. Please, Please do. <laughs> now, I would add something to the question which would be interesting to hear from my brother, the genius. Um, the pressure is on. Yes. <laughs> so is there room, I mean, in addition to what I just said, is there room for anger against God, against yourself, against life, against... <coughs> you know, I mean, the emotion is still there. Even if someone can accept all of this, you know, there's emotions. The whole thing is fraught with emotions. So, wh you know, what is, is there room for? Is there not room? I mean, what is the whole... What do you do, basically? I mean, is that right. acceptable? Yeah, actually, you know what? That's a scripted question. And I should have <laughs> said it. My, I'm sorry. You're fired. But I got a little jet lag, too. I didn't come in from Israel, but Santa Monica, same thing. Really, I should uh, take my shoes off my uh, feet. What, what? what? You heard what I said. Because uh, 
This is the story of uh, Moses standing in front of the burning bush. And the bush burns, and it's not being consumed. This is the first vision of the first Jewish leader, Rebbe, master, teacher. And his first encounter with God. And his first encounter with God is an encounter in the midst of pain. A tree is burning, and it's not being consumed. What did Moses see? It wasn't only a thorn bush on fire. Moses looked and he saw the next 3,000 years of Jewish history and of human history. Moses saw the six million. Moses saw the bodies of children being strewn in the streets of the Holy Land. Moses saw the pogroms, the tragedies, the senseless deaths. And Moses approaches it and says, let me see, let me, let me understand, let me comprehend, let me experience. And God says, the first thing, Moses, take your shoes off your feet. Because the soil upon which you stand is sacred. When you're standing in the presence of a person who experiences pain and suffering, you're standing, as Simon said, in the presence of holiness. And in the presence of holiness, you remove your shoes and you remain silent. You don't become a philosopher. That's the first experience that Moses the message that Moses gets from God. You want to become a rabbi? You want to become a leader? When you see pain, take your shoes off your feet. I mean, this morning I received a letter from a woman, it was literally this morning, who lost her 11-year-old son from cancer. And the boy struggled for eight years. And I know this woman quite well. And she writes me a story and I was reading it on the email and I was crying this afternoon as I was reading it. She says, three times in his life, my son asked me, Mommy, why? Am I so bad? She's a believing Jew. The first time she told him, right when he contracted the disease, every descent is for the sake of an ascent. He looked at her and he said, okay. He was seven. Or even younger, I mean, I was younger. Okay. A while later, it became more serious and more severe, more painful. Mommy, why? And she became more philosophical with them. Divine providence, God is good, he has his own calculations, he has his own script, we don't understand. He looked at her and he said, okay. Then she told me it was two weeks before the end. And her life has been transformed by now as well. And he can barely speak. And he looks at her and he says, Mommy, why, why would God do this to me? And she said at that moment she took, I took him. And I embraced him. And I said, uh, Yankel, Jacob. I really don't know. And I cried. And she said that that answer, he embraced very deeply. And he died two weeks later. But that wasn't an answer. But you know what it was? It was a respect for the awe, for the transcendence of the experience of a child in pain. Because a person who suffered is in another reality. Their depth their sensitivity, their, uh, their humanness is on a different level. And the first thing you can't do, as Simon emphasizes, don't profane it. Don't, don't degrade it. Be in reverence of it. When she said, I really don't know why, she respected the intensity, the realness of the experience that words and explanations and philosophies really, really don't capture one scene there's a second scene in Exodus a second scene in Exodus 
The second scene is God tells Moses, go tell the Jews that God is going to liberate you. And Moses says, I'm going to come to Egypt and they're going to ask me, what's the name of this God? What should I tell them? So you think God would give some nice name, the Tetragrammaton, or the subconscious, non-existential, transcendental, nirvana, cosmic energy, what else? <laughs> right? Or the Lord, your mighty God, who will wreak vengeance upon those who violate the covenant, etc. And God tells Moses, so what, what's your name? So God says, Eya Asher Eya. I will be with them as I will be with them. Oh, very nice answer. You know, he failed. <laughs> God can't answer such a simple question as a name. What's your name? Peter Himmelman. <laughs> Just say your name for heaven's sake. No, there's something deep. Moses, the Jews didn't know God's name. If they know about God, they know about some name of God. If they, know, if they don't believe in God, a name is not going to convince them that he exists. Moses was asking another question. I'm going to come to Egypt and say, God is wants to liberate you. They're going to say, what's the name? What is the personality of this character who for 86 years can watch Pharaoh bathe daily in the blood of Jewish children that he slaughtered? After 86 years, he decided... Ah, oh, I'm a nice, sensitive Lord who will liberate you from the enslavement in Egypt and will bring you to a beautiful land that flows with milk and honey. Gee, no thanks. A nation that's been targeted and abused and violated, male children cast into the sea. Where have you been for eight decades when mothers saw their children being torn away from their bosom? Now you're going to liberate us? What is his name? Who is he? What type of personality does he have? Did he never go to a good school? Nobody ever taught him about humanness, about sensitivity. What's the name of this guy? What type of, you know? That's a good question. God doesn't answer it. God never answers the question. He never answers the question. He just tells Moses, I'm not going to tell you my name. There is a place where the finite and the infinite don't meet. Where God's mind, who created our mind, is not captured by our mind. Just impossible. It's senseless. It's, 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 absurd. it's beyond absurdity. He says, just tell Moses, just tell them, I will be there in this exile as I will be there in other exiles. I may not wipe away their tears, but every tear of theirs I make mine. I may not obliterate suffering and pain from this world. I don't. But I am not an aloof, apathetic, detached God who sees the plan and says, like a good surgeon, you know, this is the process and this is what we have to do. Before you're crying, he says, I'm crying. I'm with them. I experience the entire intensity of the pain. So that... You have me, you're not lonely. This he tells Moses. That's a second scene. One more scene I have to share with you. And this answers Simon's question. There is a moment in the burning bush, one of my favorite biblical moments. Moses is watching the fire after he took off his shoes and he came close. And God turns to him and says, I am the God of your father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Bible says Moses hid his face because he didn't want to look. Strange verse. A whole time he's approaching. Let me see. Let me look. Let me gaze. Let me take it in. Suddenly when God identifies himself, I'm not looking. He hides his face. One of the great mystics said something powerful. God offered Moses at that moment to be able to appreciate the divinity within pain. God told Moses, look at the burning bush and you'll see God. At this moment, I am allowing you to take a glimpse into heaven's perspective on suffering. I'm allowing you to see the script of history from my perspective. Most of humanity, it's like you come into a Broadway show or you watch a movie for five minutes and you say, eh, stupid movie. It's a three-hour plot. 
Most of us see our little glimpse into the movie. Moses, I'm allowing you to see history from my perspective. Take a look. You know what Moses tells God? He refused to allow God to explain to him the mystery of pain. You know why? Because he knew that the price of appreciating pain from heaven's perspective is too high. It means that he will cease to be human. And here I see the most vulnerable moment of Moses. He sacrificed that intimate buddy-like relationship with the creator of the cosmos to be able to feel the pain of a human being who lost a loved one, etc., in its entire texture and its entire depth and, and, and strength and intensity. He says, I don't want to see it from your perspective because if, that, if I will, I will not be able to be a real Rebbe. I will not be able to be a little, real leader. So at the end of the portion, as Simon says, he turns to God in anger and he says, why do you make a nation suffer? In that sense, Moses follows Abraham who screams, will the judge of the world not do justice? All the great prophets and rabbis and sages and tzaddikim, men of faith, you would think they would say, listen, God knows better. He wants to destroy Sodom. He knows. Abraham says, no, you can't do it. Chutzpah. I created the city. I'll tell you what justice is. But the more faith you have, the more faith in God you have, the question becomes so much more powerful. How do you allow this to happen? And this has been the contribution of Judaism in the, in the sense the pain. Moses says, I don't want to understand God's perspective, not only because I'm incapable, but if you understand God's perspective, you're failing to live up to what a human being has to live up to. And that is to protest, to fight, to get angry, to scream, to thunder. Why? Till when? There's a partnership. God says I cause the pain don't accept it you protest so Moses Moses wants to continue Moses wants to continue to protest and finally I think it's important to make this observation the question why is not a secular question it's a religious question if you're really secular, you shouldn't ask why. It makes perfectly sense. It makes perfect sense. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because cookies crumble in different ways. Why not? If we are here by mistake, if the cosmos is just a random accident and a process of 15 billion years of evolution from bacteria to apes to human beings, who exactly do you want should dictate, oh, you're a good person? The car is not going to hit you. You want the metal of the car to stop and say, oh, this person is a good person. I can't touch them. I'm sorry, metals don't have moral spiritual consciousnesses. I know a guy who, uh, similar, he lost a sister. Uh, she crossed the street on Long Island and a train hit her. 29 years old. And he just told me, but I'm an atheist, Rabbi Jacobson. How did this happen? She was the glue of the family. She held the family. How did it happen? So I listened to him for months, and then he says, you're always silent. Tell me an answer. That if you're giving me permission, I'll say something. You are asking how. I'll tell you how. It was 9 o'clock at night. She was holding an umbrella. Her umbrella happened to be black. It was raining. The guy in the train doesn't have the best eyesight, and it was dark, and she was crossing, and her head was like this, so he didn't see her. That's how it happened. He says, no, I know technically how it happened, but how did it happen? I say, I'll tell you again, trains move, and when there's a person, the train is more powerful than the person. He says, no, but how can such a sick thing happen? I said, you can't ask it. Why not? Who is, is there a force in the world that says, oh, his sister is such a beautiful person. We can't touch her. And the Rebbe used to prove from this, what Simon said, that deep down, 
everybody feels that there ought to be justice in the world. Because everybody really experiences God on some level. And since we do experience God, we say, if God is good, how do you allow, allow an innocent woman or man or child to die like that? Senselessly and brutally. So it's not a secular question with all due respect for the paganist and for the secularist. It's an emotional question, but not a real academic question. If you're lucky, the cookie crumbles at the age of, at the age of 100. And if you're not, it can crumble at the age of 21, heaven forbid. But there's no heaven to be frustrated towards or resentful towards. So the more faith you have, the greater the question, the deeper, the deeper the question.